What's up everybody, Jason from Jason's Exotic Reptiles. Today we're gonna to talk about a long overdue topic and that is how to breed Burmese pythons. So as you can see, I don't have a snake in my hands right now, but I'm gonna take you around the room. I'm gonna show you some adult Burmese pythons that are gravid. I'm gonna show you some pregnant boa constrictors just to make a point on some temperatures and things to look out for. Bring you to my incubator, show you the incubation medium and uh, all these kinds of tips and tricks that hopefully by the end of this video, you guys will be able to successfully breed Burmese pythons. So without further ado, let's flip it Around, I'm gonna show you some adults and we'll go from there when I breed my Burmese pythons I do it very similar to boa constrictors and the only difference between Burmese pythons and boa constrictors that I've really noticed is that Burmese pythons tend to be a quicker acting copulation so Burmese pythons I may put them together and then within the first couple hours there's gonna be some breeding activity and copulation occurring Whereas with boa constrictors, I might have to keep them in the cage together for a couple days to a couple weeks until I actually see some breeding activity occurring. So kind of getting into Burmese python breeding in general. My season for Burmese python starts around early to mid-September. So around early to mid-September, I'm gonna start dropping my temperatures. It works out pretty well, similar to boa constrictors. That's exactly what I do again is around early mid-September, maybe late September, depending on what my life is looking like at that time of year. And what I will do is I'll start slowly bringing my temperatures down one degree per week until I get a 12 degree temperature drop. Um, at that same time, unlike boa constrictors, I don't stop the feeding on boas, but I will start slowing the feeding down on Burmese pythons. So with the Burmese pythons, I would say after I've dropped about halfway through, so around November-ish or so, I'll stop the feeding. And the reason for that is I don't want my males or females to go into shed at this time period. I want to keep them so they're kind of in their peak condition. I want them to shed out and be ready to be finished with shedding. And then by the time I pair them together, they're done with their shed cycle. So the berms themselves, I may start in the mid of the season. So I might start putting them in in November, see if anything occurs. Within a couple hours to a day, I'll know immediately whether the female isn't ready. So breeding in general is gonna all occur on the female's terms. The male may try to breed, but nothing's actually gonna happen unless the female's ready. So around again, November-ish or so, mid-November, early December, that's usually when I start seeing copulations occurring. So that's where I'm gonna start pairing my males with my females. And again, immediately I'll know right away, is this gonna be a successful breeding? If it's not, I pull the male out. I'll usually give him a small male. I might give the female a small male. And then a couple weeks after that, I'll try pairing them again. So again, immediately is gonna see some breeding activity. It usually occurs between December-ish through January, through the end of January. And then that's where I'm gonna start seeing the females start to, to invert and roll over. Kind of scary the first time you see it because you walk in and you look like you have a dead snake. But in actuality, she's just kind of moving those follicles and building those follicles around, regulating her body temperature. So let's take a look a couple, at a couple females I have here. I'll show you kind of the male that I put with her and I'll also show you what I do for labeling. So let's take a look. Okay, so we have this girl here. As you can see, she's pretty hissy. She is a hypo that is, let me see what I got her card here. So this is what I do for labeling as well. Um, so she is a hypo, 100% head albino, 50% uh, head granite, 50% head green, 50% head labyrinth. So, um, so she's kind of a mix for everything. We're gonna see if we can prove her out this year. But she's sitting on some eggs. She's not sitting on eggs, but she has some eggs in her. And what I usually do, so the important dates that I mark down are gonna be here. Excuse my messy handwriting, but so on 2-5-2020, um, I saw a possible ovulation. So I wasn't sure, I saw some swelling. And a lot of the times what you guys see, you guys will see is you'll see people talking about a pre-ovulation swell. That's essentially what I saw on 2-5. What I like to do is I like to, again, write that date down, that 2-5 date, as if I saw it and I wasn't sure what it was, I'll put some question marks. And then if I know I saw it, I'll put an exclamation point. So on 223, I saw an ovulation. There was no doubt about it. Or actually, I'm sorry, that might be 213. Um, there was no doubt about it, or 313, I'm sorry. 313, I saw an ovulation. There was no doubt about it that there was an ovulation there. And uh, that's, a, that's an important date. So I put an exclamation point if I know it, or I'll put a question mark if I'm not sure. And then I will write the actual uh, shed date. So this is her post ovulation shed. And this is the important date because about two or three weeks after this, actually more about three weeks after this, this is where you're gonna start seeing them uh, lay their eggs. So this girl, she shed on 4-3. Today is 
417, so I would say in the next week or so, she's going to drop me some nice babies if all goes well. Um, kind of going up, I do the same thing over here. So this girl, this is not a hypo, she just has a wrong tag on there. Um, so she, I, I thought I saw a possible ovulation on 226. I definitely saw an ovulation on, on 321, and then she shed on 411. So that's her post ovulation shed. So, and they will typically sit in these tight coils like this. Um, I think this is, yeah, they're all very happy once they're sitting on some eggs. Uh, but they'll sit in these tight coils like this and they're almost prepping to be laying for eggs. They'll typically move from the hot side to the cool side. So this is kind of her cool side over here. That's her hot side over there. And this is how they'll kind of thermoregulate their body temperature. Now, how I mentioned in the pairing, a lot of good indicators that I get for before I actually get to seeing the ball, seeing them actually breeding and any breeding activity is I'll see the females, they're all gonna be, at least on this rack set up here, they're all gonna be on the cool ends of their enclosures. They'll all be sitting on this side. When they're building follicles, they like to get into the cool end and they like to stay there. That's very similar to boa constrictors where once they start building their follicles, they move to the cool end. And then once they ovulate, they're almost always gonna be sitting at this hot spot temperature. So I'm gonna grab a temperature gun and I wanna show you one other thing that's pretty important about gravid pythons or pregnant boas. Okay, so we're back. I have my temperature gun here. I use one of these guys from Home Depot. It's, um, I don't know, this was kind of a nice one that I got at the time, but you can get them from, from any pet store. And the big thing that I ask, get asked all the time is, is my boa or is my python pregnant or gravid? So what I like to tell people as a hands down definite yes it is, is if you take your temperature gun, they will almost always be sitting around 90, or sorry, 89 degrees. So almost any pregnant or gravid python or boa is gonna be sitting at 89 degrees. So you can see she's 89 degrees here. Her hot spot, I don't know what that hot spot is. That hot spot's about 89 or so. So she's exactly what her hot spot is. She has access to a cool end, and that's 80. But let's just kind of go through these females here and you'll see well, she's about 86. Her hotspot might be a little bit cooler. Her hotspot's 88, so she may have moved from her cool end, but they will almost always be at that temperature uh, because that's kind of where we would incubate their eggs at. So same thing with this girl. So she's at 86. Boas will almost always be at 89. Uh, and this could be, again, because she's moving around. But, uh, but that's a good indicator. So a non-pregnant snake is gonna be sitting around 80 degrees or so. So let's go look at a couple of those. Just for the heck of it, I might show you guys a boa constrictor in this video who is pregnant. And uh, then I'll show you one that's not. And you can see the difference between their body temperatures. Okay, so we're back with a couple boa constrictors here. And this is a BCL girl, a boa constrictor longicata. And again, here's my dates that I wrote on here. So there's 3 8, or 328, she saw the ovulation and then uh, 412 she shed. Boa constrictors a little different. I'll maybe do a whole different video on boa constrictors for you, but very similar to the pythons. They're always going to be sitting at that right temperature there. So she's about 78 degrees uh, from getting her in the right spot. Uh, this girl down here, this is, uh, well, she's crawling in her bin. Um, <laughs> but this girl here, this is a uh, Nicaraguan T positive. She's going to be just laying babies soon. So she shed uh, her post, her ovulation was 1-1 and her shed date was 125. So again, it's about 417 now, date-wise. So she'll be laying babies for me in the next couple days. Her body temperature is 90. Um, and then here's one that's not. This one is not pregnant. She's already laid babies and she's at 84 degrees. So this is more consistent with boa constrictors because Burmese pythons tend to move around a little bit more, but they will almost always be in that uh, that upper 80s to high nine to low 90s so let's move on I'm gonna show you what I do for incubation and incubation media from here and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about the breeding all right everybody so the next step in your Burmese Python breeding is gonna be taking the eggs and putting them in the incubator now you can do maternal incubation and I've done that in the past but I've noticed that my success rate overall can be a little bit lower uh, the, just with my cage setups, I mean, you saw the racks that they're in. Uh, they're not the most ideal setup to mimic 100% humidity and perfect temperatures all the time. They have heat pads and things like that. And I want to make sure I get the highest success rate for eggs that I can possibly have. So what I'll do, and most python breeders in general are going to do this, or, or colubrids or whatever species you breed in general, is as soon as they lay, you're going to uncoil the female. You're going to take the eggs from them and put them in an incubator. 
So the incubator I use is the one I have behind me. I made a whole video on how to make an incubator and I did it on this incubator behind me. It's essentially an old cooler fridge that I put some heat tape, some fans, and a thermostat on. And it works really well. It's been working for me for, I don't know, maybe five years or so. I've made incubators my whole life out of old mini fridges and things like that. They work fantastic. Essentially you're making an incubated box with a heating element in it. So it's the reverse of a refrigerator. So. Now, what we do, at least for me, what I like to do for Burmese pythons and python eggs in general, is I use a mix of vermiculite and perlite. There's other substrates you can use. You can use things like hatchrite, or you can use those sim containers that are really nice. They have like this light fixture grid on them, and then you put water in the bottom. It keeps your humidity in, in really good shape. Um, I've had bad success with hatchrite. I found that those little water crystals they put in there dry out and essentially you're buying an overpriced perlite product. So what I do, I have next to me here, is when I go to the store, I go to Home Depot and I like to use a mix of vermiculite and perlite. And I'll show you what that looks like. I'll show you the consistency that you want it. I have an egg container next to me. I like to use these containers in here, but container size really doesn't matter. It just depends on the number of eggs that you have. So in the container I have next to me here, this is one of the egg boxes that I have. As soon as they're gonna be ready to lay, so you saw in the video, I kinda, in the next week or two, I should have some healthy eggs if all goes well. So about a week before that happens, I like to get my egg box and my substrate ready. So my camera died right in the middle of telling you guys about the egg container and the egg box. But uh, we're going to pick up where we left off. So what, again, I like to use that mix of vermiculite and perlite. And as you can see, here's my container in here. Um, it's, I use about a 50-50 mix. It really doesn't make a difference. But the consistency of this is what's going to make the difference in your Burmese pythons or in your eggs in general. Um, so what I like to do is I'll put the bur I'll put the vermiculite, I'll put the perlite together in the same box, then I'll mix it all together, again maybe 50-50 mix, you don't need to be precise with it, and then uh, I like to add water until it clumps, so if I hold it in my hand, it makes kind of like this shape that will form a shape, but at the same time it crumbles apart very easily. So I'll do that again just so you can see, maybe I'll zoom into the camera a little bit here. So you have this clump, it holds its shape but if I crumble it very lightly, it falls apart. That's what you're really gonna be looking for when you want the egg substrate. If you make it too damp, it's gonna clump together and it won't fall apart like that. If you do that, just add a little bit more. It's not a big deal. Add a little bit more vermiculite to this and that, uh, that dry vermiculite will, will uh, wash it all out. So again, this is kind of my egg box. I put in a couple inches or so and I put my lid. The lid is very important. Um, I personally don't like to do any ventilation in my lid. I like to use these kind of sealed up containers. This one here has a nice ring around it that holds all the humidity in. Then what I'll do is every couple days I'll go in, check on the eggs, I'll pop the bin off, I'll vent it out a little bit, and then I'll close it back up and put it in. I want to be in the incubator every couple days just to check things out, but at the same time I don't want to be opening it up so that I'm constantly bothering the eggs. So let's kind of cut this here. I'm going to go back over. I want to talk to you guys a little bit more about the breeding part of it and uh, we can kind of cut the video. All right, everybody, we're back. We're gonna do the recap. You know I couldn't do the whole video without holding a snake, so I'll just show this girl off. This is a female blizzard Burmese python, so she's an albino super hypo Burmese python. Uh, one of my favorites that I produced over the couple past couple years. I think she's last year's baby, and uh, I really like this girl. She's she's just kind of been my, my pet along the way. Her temperament's super chill, and she eats great. So I'll show her off a little bit now. We'll do a little bit towards the end of the video again. She's in shed, so she's looking a little cloudy right now, but she's a good girl. So, now, I kinda, kind of a, a, a total recap on what we just talked about is uh, kind of the, just the breeding season in general. Um, we call it a season, but breeding for any species, Burmese, pythons, boa constrictors, king snakes, rattlesnakes, cobras, whatever you want to do, it's, it's not a season, it's a breeding year. Um, and too many people just purchase some animals and say, I'm going to breed them. It doesn't work that way. It's a whole year long process. Bringing the temperatures down, reducing food, all that stuff doesn't work unless you're going through the cycle of the entire year. So let's say I go and I pick up some Burmese pythons. I don't know, let's say I have adults. My adult Burmese pythons, I've been raising them. This girl here, two, three years from now, she'll be a breeder. What I'm going to do is technically my season is starting in January. 
um, January, every snake in my collection gets their temperatures at, at their winter time and I break my season up into quarters. I've gone over this in all my videos that I've talked about breeding. My season is quarterly. So I have three months winter, three months ramp up, which would be like my spring, three months summer and three months cool down. Give me four months of the year, uh, four, uh, four seasons of the year. So that is technically my breeding season, the entire year long process. And the importance of that is I can't just go out and purchase some animals and expect them to be bred. So if I do go out and purchase adult animals, it is still a whole year long cycle. Now you might get lucky and you might, if you purchased an adult animal from me and you went to go breed it, there's a good chance that it'll have follicles, the male will be ready, everything will be in condition and it'll work out well for you. But if you don't, you can't expect to buy animals and then a couple months later breed them. For the main reason being that it is the whole year long as a season. So in that sense um again in my winter time i'm going to be you know around around january their food isn't going to be as high i'm not going to be feeding them as often their temperatures are, are going to be cooler and then come springtime things are going to get ramped up uh, i'm going to start feeding them heavily uh, i'll maybe do it every other week for burmese pythons and boas it's a little different but essentially i'm going to be feeding them more than i normally would I'm going to be feeding them aggressively and I'm going to do that all through summertime. So this way I have some like really nice weight on the females and then during the fall I'm going to slowly start bringing their male size down a little bit. I don't necessarily like to reduce the feeding frequency for boas but for Burmese pythons which is what we're talking about here I do like to just slow their frequency down. So if I'm feeding them every let's say two weeks in this ramp up in this summertime then in the winter time, I might go to every three weeks, then every month, and then I might stop feeding altogether while they're breeding and up to the breeding season. And then once I see ovulation, a lot of the times your females are gonna refuse food anyways. The males will eat all year long, but I reduce their food intake because the heavy males and, and, a, and a fed male is gonna be a lazy male. So um, I'm kind of, I'm decreasing their food all through the winter time and then come again springtime, I'm ramping it up. So once your females ovulate, they tend to get really hungry. Um, at least in my experience they have. They're gonna be like eating machines. They're constantly gonna be searching their cage. This is a time period where you can't screw it up. Don't feed them heavily. You can give them small meals to hold them over, but if you start feeding them heavily, they're gonna be putting more focus on digesting their food and less on incubating those eggs the way they should. The fortunate part is that at least when they digest their food and incubate eggs, they're both gonna be on the heat source, but if you don't have a proper heat source, they might kind of move their body around again and focus more on digestion and less on keeping those egg temperatures up. So I will give them food, but it's going to be a smaller prey item throughout this process. Um, I hope I hope this video was helpful to you guys. I know I was jumping around a little bit and I was showing you some different stuff, some things that I do, but I wanted to do something a little different than me sitting in front of the camera like this in all my other videos. I do have another video that I'm going to do and I'm going to bring you around to kind of show you I don't want to say everything, but almost everything I have in my collection. We're going to look at some cool boas, some cool Burmese pythons. I have some nice colubrids that we're going to look at. And uh, I'm just going to go through everything. So it's been asked for enough, and I think it's time I do it. I'm going to go through my baby racks, my holdbacks, my adults, my breeders, everything I have, you guys are going to see in the next video. So I hope you enjoyed this one. Please like, subscribe, share. If you find this video worthy, um, sharing during this channel really helps out a lot. And I appreciate you guys continuing to support. So thank you for very much and talk to you guys soon.